Hey everyone, uh, this is going to be an updated video about whether or not an eGPU can increase performance within your own music production. Um, I think the last video I created, I missed quite a few points, and the tests that I conducted were a bit dramatic. So in this video, I'm going to conduct the same test, but using actual projects that I created and released eventually to Spotify and other streaming platforms. So first things first, uh, who can benefit from an eGPU? I think there's a few people. For example, people who are using laptops without dedicated graphics cards, uh, people who are using mini PCs, such as an Intel Nook or Mac Minis, and also people who are using desktops, which do not have a video card installed. So that would include people who are using the onboard video port that usually has integrated graphics and shares memory with the CPU. So let's give a few examples of some of the systems that could benefit from an eGPU. Starting with the MacBook Pro 2015, 13 inch and 15 inch, aside from a few models. If you look here on Newegg, you could scroll down to the specifications area. And if you go down to the graphics section, it will say integrated card, which essentially means that it's going to share system memory with the CPU. And typically anything that says Intel graphics or Intel UHD is going to be an integrated card. If we go over to a common desktop that Dell puts out, which is an Optiplex, we're going to run into the same type of graphics, which is the Intel UHD Graphics 630. Another system that Dell makes is this basic XPS 8930 tower desktop, and that also comes with the integrated UHD Graphics 630. Again, for a desktop, you're not going to need the external enclosure, which would act as an eGPU. You could just get the graphics card by itself and install it into the desktop's PCIe port. If we look at Intel's mini PC, See the NUC or the Nuke, however you want to say it. This also comes with a Thunderbolt 3 port on the back. But again, we're still looking at the Intel Iris Plus 640 integrated graphics. We could he head over to a more common laptop from Microsoft called the Surface Pro. If we scroll down to the graphics section, again, it's going to be the Intel Iris Plus graphics. The video memory is going to be shared with the CPU, and this is going to be an integrated solution that's not going to be as powerful. Same story from the Lenovo X. X1 Carbon. They're going to be working with an Intel UHD Graphics 620. And lastly, just to show people out there who may have maybe an older gaming system or an older desktop they set up, if you're not using a graphics card that's installed into the PCIe port, the integrated graphics is most likely not going to be adequate enough, even on the newest and best motherboards. This motherboard from Asus has integrated graphics as well, but again, we're looking at a similar Intel UHD graphics chip chipset, which won't be able to give you enough power and help offload some of the processing from the CPU. One great way to check the specs of your Mac is to use this website called everymac.com. From the homepage, if you scroll down, you'll have a bunch of different options to choose from. Since I'm using a Mac mini, I could click on Mac mini. I could scroll down to the model that I purchased, which is the i5 model. And again, we could scroll down and see what my processor type is, as well as the video card that I'm using. We could see here the Mac mini 20 2018 comes with the Intel UHD Graphics 630, which is an integrated chip that's going to share memory with the system. If we go back to the home page and scroll down to MacBook Pro, almost every model from 2015 has the integrated graphics. I think the only models that don't have it are these DG models here and here. But if we click, for example, on this i7 15 inch MacBook Pro from 2015, and we scroll down to the video card, we're going to be using the Iris Pro 5200, which is an integrated graphics card. If we go back and we click on this DG model here, when we scroll down again, we're going to see that this model actually comes with an AMD Radeon R9, which is a dedicated graphics card, which works in conjunction with the Intel Iris Pro 5200, which is the integrated graphics card. So to make sure your Mac is actually running an integrated or dedicated graphics card, this is a good website to kind of verify that information. To compare different graphics cards, I use the website userbenchmark.com, and for graphics you could put gpu.userbenchmark.com, and you could go over here to the compare section and type in which graphics cards you want to compare. For example, if I want to compare the integrated graphics card in my Mac Mini to the graphics card I installed in my eGPU, I could look up the graphics on every Mac, which looks like it's the Intel UHD 630, so we could type it in here, and we can compare that with the graphics card I actually bought for my external GPU, which is the RX 580 from AMD. 
If we scroll down, we could see the performance increase is over 800% just on the effective speed area. If we go down to the average user benchmark, we're getting almost 800% there. Of course, this is also great for gaming, getting over 120% increase on games like CSGO and Fortnite. And if you scroll further down, it'll give you a little rundown of what they think about the cards. Next, I'm going to address a few things that people said in regards to my first video when I posted it online. One of the first people from the KBR forum kind of stated that Ableton Live was running fine using the embedded GPU of his laptop, which was the Lenovo Y730. After going back and forth with him a few times, he stated that he was not using an external monitor in his tests, which I think would have been much more taxing on his GPU compared to just using the internal LCD. It also depends on which plugins you're using. A few people in other threads have stated that plugins such as Convolution Reverb would benefit greatly from an external GPU, as well as other plugins like FabFilter who have built GPU acceleration into their plugins to help offload some of the processing from the CPU. Now FabFilter actually did this a while ago, back in 2012. They essentially said all plugins now contain the GPU powered graphics acceleration in introduced in FabFilter Pro DS, ensuring ultra smooth animation while leaving the main CPU free to do audio processing. So when you have an integrated graphics chip, it's not gonna be as efficient as a dedicated graphics chip, such as an external GPU or a laptop that has one built in already. If we go to a thread on Reddit that I posted in, a user stated, sorry, this is BS. And he essentially said, my GPU wasn't set up properly. Another user agreed and also stated, unless you're trying to real-time process tons of DSP, which is almost never necessary, this shouldn't even remotely be a concern. He went on to say people made timeless hit albums on two-track recorders. There's zero reason anyone needs to run 20 VSTs with effects simultaneously without flattening some audio and overdubbing. Now, there's a few points here. To address the last point of what people need to do within any DAW or music production, that is absolutely correct. You don't don't need an eGPU as you can freeze and flatten audio to help offload that processing to your CPU, but you also don't need an SSD. You don't need 32 gigs of memory. You don't need an $800 audio interface or a $500 plugin. There's a lot of things that we do not need when creating music, but we buy certain things to help us become more efficient or for better quality. To address the timeless hit albums on two track recorders, well, of course, I also agree with that. Many hits that have been created decades decades ago were not created with the equipment we have today. But I think one should also realize that the times have changed drastically. Producers and music makers can build an entire studio in their bedroom. That type of thing was not possible 50 years ago. Back in the 70s and 80s, they didn't have 20 gigabyte libraries in contact, which require a certain amount of memory and CPU processing in which you would need to get an updated PC or external hardware to help the performance. Regardless of what equipment people used and how inferior it was to today, you can't apply that logic to the requirements of each piece of hardware. Some people today are going to need less RAM or less hard drive space because maybe they create most of their sounds from within one synthesizer. Other people are going to need more RAM and more hard drive space because they use large libraries such as what Native Instruments offers or libraries from output such as analog strings. And of course, one of the main things for this video is whether or not you're going to want to stream or record using OBS while you make music. I will later show in the tests that it is actually impossible to stream through OBS while using certain buffer sizes in Ableton. You will get a massive amount of audio crackling and audio glitches, but with an eGPU, you do not get that. Other people were kind of curious whether or not an eGPU can be beneficial in other DAWs, such as as Logic Pro. And there was this post on Reddit just four months ago in which this user stated, testing with and without my eGPU, I noticed most third-party plugins push most of the load into my GPU instead of my CPU, allowing Logic to hold up even better and performance is flawless. So that's just one example of how someone could benefit from an eGPU within their DAW. 
If you're wondering which Windows laptops you should buy for music production, I would say almost any gaming laptop is going to be good enough, especially because it has a dedicated graphics card within it. If we take this Lenovo Y730 and we scroll down to the graphics section, we could see it has an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1050 Ti, which is a dedicated card, which also has four gigabytes of dedicated video memory that it will not share with the CPU. All right, let's get on to the testing now. So for this test, I only did two different projects and I made the tabs a little more simple on this chart the first two are going to be the songs the third is going to be how Ableton handled OBS running in the background as if I were streaming or recording a video and the fourth tab is going to show you the difference in temperature between each configuration using degrees and Celsius starting off with the first tab I played around one to two minutes of audio at different buffer sizes in which there was 74 plugins active within the mix itself with around four plugins on the master bus as far as the track count I believe there was around 55 active tracks including all drums vocals and instruments at the bottom of the graph here you could click through each buffer size and look at the CPU usage differences between using a Mac mini and an eGPU. And just to quickly clarify, eGPU both means I had both of my monitors plugged in directly to the eGPU and Mac mini both just means I had both of my monitors plugged in directly to the Mac mini. There are different configurations you could set up with the GPU. For example, you don't have to use an external monitor at all with an eGPU. For instance, if you're using an eGPU with a laptop, but you want to use the internal screen on your laptop without having to use an external monitor. To utilize the power of the eGPU, you can open up applications, right click on the program in which you want to use, click on get info, and click on the checkbox that says prefer external GPU. This will allow the external GPU to process the graphics portion of whatever program you're going to be using. So as for this first song, there wasn't a huge improvement uh, either way. It looks like on average between all four buffer sizes, there was an around 11% improvement when using an eGPU. And this is specifically talking about the CPU usage. If we go to my next track called Go Away, there was a slightly larger performance increase here. On this track, there was around 79 plugins within the mix with around five on the master bus and in total around 50 tracks active, including the drums, vocals, and instruments. Now, if we go into the OBS portion of these results, this is where things start to get quite drastic. I'm going to let you guys hear a portion of how the project sounded when I was using the 256 and 512 buffer sizes of my project Go away there's going to be extreme audio glitches as well as constant clicks and pops Now in this test, I started recording using OBS while playing one to two minutes of audio at different buffer sizes. I had OBS up on my second screen at the top to also simulate a stream scenario. And one thing to note out of the gate is OBS ran at 20% usage when using the Mac mini both configuration, but with an eGPU, OBS only ran at 13%. Now, if you look at the bottom of OBS, it'll show you the CPU percentage that it's currently using. Right now, during the time of this video, it's fluctuating between 13 and 14%, and I'm also using an eGPU at this moment. So if we take a look at the graph here, we could see there's around a 76% improvement at the 256 buffer size when using an eGPU over the Mac Mini. And you would think that going to a higher buffer size is going to make the improvement less drastic, but it stayed around the same while streaming or recording with OBS. At 512 buffer size, we're getting around a 63% improvement with the eGPU being around 29% CPU usage while the Mac mini has 47% CPU usage. And at the 1024 buffer size, we're still getting a 70% improvement with the eGPU being at 23% CPU usage and the Mac mini being at 39%. Also on the left side, I note if any buffer sizes had audio glitches or how smooth everything ran with the eGPU, there was no audio glitches, no clicks, no pops. Everything ran smoothly at all buffer sizes while streaming with OBS on the second monitor. At 256, you heard the clicks and pops. It was actually unplayable. At 512, it was slightly playable with clicks and pops occurring more than usual. And the CPU was fluctuating constantly from 43 to 52%, as well as the internal fan starting to rev up quite loud. 
The only time the Mac Mini ran somewhat smooth with no audio glitches was at the 1024 buffer size, although the internal fan did start up after a few minutes of play. If we go to the temperature tab, it'll show four different configurations, again playing the same song Go Away, at the 1024 buffer size. There's quite a big range here, but I think the most drastic range came in when streaming with OBS, in which an eGPU netted results 10 degrees Celsius cooler than not using an eGPU. On the Mac Mini, the temperature rose up to 98 degrees Celsius while using OBS and playing audio from my project Go Away at the 1024 buffer size. While using an eGPU, it dropped down 10 degrees, which is quite substantial if you ask me. Having the temperature run cooler is going to help the overall life of your CPU as well as increase productivity by not forcing the CPU to throttle. If the analyzers and meters were hidden, and not displayed on my second monitor, the temperature would drop around five degrees Celsius, which is also kind of interesting. So for people who only use one monitor, of course, this is not gonna be a problem, but for other people who use their second monitor for all your metering plugins, just take note of the increase in temperature that this may cause. So that's pretty much it for this video. Again, if you guys have any other questions or concerns or want to ask about anything I didn't cover in this video, I'll try my best to answer it. But I think I covered a lot of things that I didn't cover in the initial video I came out with a few weeks ago. So I hope this will help all you guys out and will give you a good idea of how the performance difference will be between using an eGPU and not using one. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video.